to give this talk and to present our work. Um, my name is Ankit Kambadi. I am a postdoctorate fellow uh, at the University of Pennsylvania in the Complex Systems Group. Uh, the Complex Systems Group is led by Dr. Danielle Bassett, who's a network scientist. Um, I'm also a member of the Center for Neuroengineering and Therapeutics at Penn, uh, also known as the CNT. The CNT, their main goal is basically to develop and test new devices um, to treat and interrogate a variety, variety of uh, nervous system disorders. And so I'll begin my, my presentation. It's entitled Epilepsy, Dysfunction in Brain Network Synchronization. So there's this emerging view in neuroscience of the brain as a, as a network system. And you can have these interrelated regions of the brain that do function, functionally specific computation um, but the individual functions of each are tightly linked to other areas that have different uh, functional goals and responsibilities. And from a graph theoretic perspective, this network um, is often modeled as a collection of nodes, where each node is a brain region, and a collection of edges between those nodes, um, which represents some sort of form of communication or interaction between these areas. And Conventional models of this network system of the brain actually exists across a variety of spatial scales. And so if you look on this plot on the left, um, it's pulled uh, from a great paper by Park and Friston, 2013 in Science, um, essentially shows various scales of brain networks look observed at, at um, coarse to fine grain um, structure. And so at the coarsest scale, you can imagine that you have these these large regions of the brain that do function-specific computation and interact uh, over several, several centimeters. Um, but then you can also have these micro-scale networks of connectivity uh, between individual neural populations or individual neurons themselves. And so while understanding the node or the brain regions that you want to study for particular, uh, in a particular system is important, Equally important is understanding what exactly the relationships between these nodes that you want to that you want to map. And so the conventional view of a brain network is actually derived from the structural or anatomical component of pathways linking brain regions together. And so imaging allows us to do diffusion tensor imaging, uh, where we can track the white matter fiber pathways between brain regions um, that give you a kind of a static view of interactions between these disparate areas. More recently, we can construct functional brain networks. These functional brain networks are time-dependent snapshots um, based on EEG, MEG, or the bold signal in the fMRI that give you a sense of which brain regions are linked based on their pattern of interaction or their pattern of similarity in the, in the exhibited electrophysiology or bold signal. And so we can study these patterns and construct these graphs uh, and understand the organization and behavior of the graphs using uh, a topological perspective. And so when we, when we examine these, the topology of brain networks, we can look over multiple scales of the network. Um, at, the, at the finer scale, we can observe the importance of every individual node in the network, uh, also known as the centrality or the hubness of a node in the network. Uh, in orange, you have a node that's extremely influential amongst all of the other blue nodes. It's strongly connected to each one of them. Um, and so you would call the, the orange node a very central node in the network. Now imagine if you have... And it, what questions, Dennis? Um, yeah. Is the network um, correlated with the connectome? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so you can also imagine these other sorts of topologies that, are, uh, that, are, that have been observed in brain networks that are, for instance, core periphery networks where you have these, these high rich clubs of highly connected nodes in the, in the center, which form some sort of centralized computation uh, and then propagates that information to the periphery of the network uh, to these more isolated blue regions. Uh, similarly, you can have more mesoscale or mesoscopic organization in the network where you have a high degree of clustering. And in uh, clustered networks, you typically look at the number of triangles that uh, ex are exhibited between each of your nodes and their connections. And the number of triangles 
represent some sort of me measure of local computation in the network. And then um, finally, we also consider the modularity of a network. The modularity tells you that these particular nodes are, are performing some sort of function specific, functionally specialized computation, and, each com and it's a compartmentalized view of computation on the brain. And so a lot, all these sort of topologies have been integrated uh, to understand not only cognition, but more recently to understand a variety of brain network disorders. And so they've mapped these topologies to brain dysfunction in Parkinson's, depression, schizophrenia, and they've implicated really more local circuits in some of these diseases and more distributed broad circuits in others, such as in schizophrenia, where you don't have necessarily one single area of dysfunction, but rather the overall topology of the brain um, together uh, is quite different than when you compare it to healthy controls. Now, in this particular talk, we're going to be talking. We're going to be examining epilepsy, and epilepsy really hasn't really benefited from this perspective of brain network dysfunction like these other diseases have. And really, it it it's a it, what will motivate here is how we can actually begin to think about epilepsy in terms of also a network disorder. So epilepsy affects 65 million people, a third of whom exhibit drug-resistant or pharmacoresistant seizures. Uh, epilepsy has a very wide etiology. You can have trauma, genetic predisposition, uh, infection, all leads to this common starting point of recurring seizures. And in this particular study, we'll be discussing at length the neocortical onset drug-resistant epilepsy, uh, which is quite difficult to, to, to treat and requires a lot of very invasive forms of mapping uh, the epileptic network. And so clinicians go in, they map the epileptic network in pharmacoresistant patients by implanting electrocorticography or ECOG arrays onto the surface of the brain. So an example of an ECOG array is, is something like this, where you have a two-dimensional grid that's, in this particular case, it's four by eight, so 32 contacts. It's implanted onto the, the subdural area of the, of the cortex, and it remains there for about one to two weeks uh, where data is now continuously collected in a phase two monitoring. And really the goal of this monitoring is to identify a target for receptive surgery. Identify where exactly you want to cut and remove a portion of the cortex. And so if we imagine this sort of electro, uh, the, this electrode array co-localized with the anatomy, the, the, each individual electrode array can be visualized in terms of its, electro, its electrical potential uh, in a vertical montage, as you see here, over time. And so you have each electrode and its electrical potential over time in, in this montage. And the three critical questions that clinicians seek to answer are, where does the seizure begin? Which of these electrodes shows the first signs of uh, electrographic onset? When does it begin? What precipitates this sort of, this, this behavior? And then how does that seizure manifest? These three questions are then uh, condensed into a prescription to the neurosurgeon to say, okay, this is the particular area of the cortex that you want to remove uh, while, while minimizing the residual effects on uh, eloquent cortex and healthy function. Now, that's all well and good, but what, what, we, what we tend to find is that this approach is actually highly qualitative and not all that quantitative. And really the origins of this idea of the epileptic network, they stem from Penfield and Jasper's era in the 1950s, where you look at the brain and you look at these individual zones of seizure onset and seizure spread, uh, and really what they, what they implicate are chunks of tissue. We're not really thinking about a network the way that we're thinking about networks in modern times. And so the goal of this work really is to apply a lot of these quantitative principles to quantify the network in epilepsy and understand its topology and organization so that we can better treat, better interrogate and then treat um, seizures from in patients. So computationally, one of the ways that we can construct functional networks is by examining the electric potential from each of these sensors um, that's implanted over time. So we can take the sensors, uh, their electric potential over time, 
bin them into individual time windows. And then in each time window, we can construct or measure the network connectivity based on the statistical similarity of the signal or between each pair of signals. And now there are multiple ways of doing this, but one popular way that has, that has been become more or less the standard is by using a coherence type measure, measure um, that gives you some sort of intuition of the, the underlying brain rhythms that are being expressed at these individual regions. Um, and the coherence of these brain rhythms are actually thought to underlie different forms of neural interactions. And for instance, in these particular examples, what I'll show is that we've computed uh, these networks as a function of two different types of frequencies. Uh, beta frequencies, which are lower range fluctuations, lower frequency fluctuations in the local field potential between 15 to 25 hertz, which are thought to exhibit more long range interactions between more distant areas of cortex and high gamma um, frequency, frequencies in this coherence band between 95 to 105 hertz that, that are thought to uh, ex be expressed between more short range um, connections and short range interactions between brain regions. And so if you think about this sort of snap, this, this view of the network uh, in a functional sense, what you actually can quantify is the time evolution of a network. And so what we plotted here is really these measures of the functional connectivity of the network evolving with time. And so what the intuition behind this is that regions of the brain or these electrodes that are connected in red uh, actually exhibit a very high degree of interaction or high degree of connectivity. Um, and colors in yellow represent regions that are more weakly connected to, the other, to those regions in, in red. And what you're seeing here is actually the network connectivity as it evolves through a seizure. And what you find is that this this highly connected strong region uh, in red is actually aligned with the area of the seizure onset zone as marked by clinicians. Um, and so in this one particular empirical example, uh, we're able to see that the area of the seizure onset zone is actually co-localized with this, with this hub of connectivity. And similarly, as a seizure begins to evolve, you'll see projections to subtemporal regions in front of pole um, of weaker, weaker connections. Um, from that, from that rich club. And so this led to actually the first study where we just wanted to quantify exactly what are these networks telling us in terms of uh, clinical information? Can we actually can we do, do, do these connection connectivity measures? Tell us something about the circuit that's predictive of uh, clinical markings. And so we examined really whether the network whether this time evolution of the network um, can tell us something about different phases of the seizure. And so by quantifying each individual snapshot of the network and using an unsupervised classification paradigm where we look at the topology of the network and cluster the topology of the network over time into different states, what we're actually able to find is an objective characterization of seizures into several different network states. And these network states actually aligned quite well with the classical notions of the onset, the evolution, and the termination of the seizure. And so if you look on this example seizure on the left, you'll see the, the onset state is in yellow-green, then this evolution state is in blue, and then this termination phase is in, is in dark gray. And each of these states is actually associated with a distinct network topology um, that's associated with each of these phases. And so we were able to actually objectively quantify these different phases of seizure. But what about the topology? What about the actual markings of where the seizure begins and where it evolves to? So one way that we, can, that we, that we tested whether our network was actually giving us useful clinical information was by aligning the networks with clinical markings of the seizure onset zone. And so from this perspective of these nodes of each individual electrode sensor, we could classify every node as being in a seizure onset zone as marked by clinician or being outside the seizure onset zone. And so based on that binary classification, we're able to actually identify three different types of connections. You can have connections that are between nodes within just the seizure onset zone. So those are in red. You have connections that are between the seizure onset zone and outside, which are in blue. 
And then you have finally connections that are only amongst nodes that are outside the Cedron zone in yellow. And what you find is if you look at the average strength of the connections within these three groups, between the three different phases of seizures, across several seizures, what you find is that there's a distribution of this average connection strength that is highly stereotyped, that highly stereotypes the connections that are actually within the seizure onset zone relative to everything else. And what this tells us is that the seizure onset zone is actually this highly connected, very strongly connected hub um, that is weak everywhere else relative to the relative to the seizure onset zone. So really what we what we motivated in this work is um, the use of these sort of network measures as potential features in a classifier that one could use to objectively parse out different areas of, of the epileptic network. Sorry, um, quick, quick question. Yeah. How, how big is the grid you inserted for this data set? Um, it varies by patient, but on average, we had a range between 80 to 120 electrodes. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, so based on, based on this sort of understanding that, that, okay, our network is actually giving us relevant clinical information based on the connectivity between these different regions, we can ask more far reaching, we can ask further questions to further highlight what's actually going on mechanistically during seizures. And this is really where, um, the novelty of the method can be tied to novel neurotechnology. So there's this, there's this recent craze in, in epilepsy and, and clinical epilepsy of using implantable devices to treat um, drug-resistant patients who aren't good candidates for resective surgery. And so using implantable devices such as those developed by the Neuropace, or, uh, those developed by Neuropace um, you can implant these, de chronic de these devices chronically and deliver stimulation in response to a detected seizure. And so these implanted devices actually take place or are housed in much broader brain computer interface systems. So you can imagine a digital acquisition system that's wired up to the brain and is compact, maybe perhaps um, implanted in the chest, uh, and in real time is recording your epileptic activity and based on an algorithm, a detector of that, of a detected seizure can responsibly stimulate a certain port of the network uh, in response to the seizure. Now, one of the challenges that such a device faces is in really an incomplete understanding of where exactly to stimulate. A lot of current applications based on um, prior knowledge say, let's just stimulate the seizure onset zone. But that often doesn't lead to the best course of outcome in these patients. <coughs> and really, what we're, what we're trying to motivate here is how can we use this network approach to better identify a clinical target uh, in conjunction with the use of these devices or perhaps even resective surgery to more strategically intervene in the network? And so one, one critical question that comes about this um, is, has long been elusive to clinicians, is really how do we contain a seizure? So you imagine that patients exhibit often two forms of seizures. They have vocal seizures that began in one circumscribed area of cortex and then kind of spread to nearby areas and then fizzle out. They don't often spread to these other electrodes um, down here. However, you have these distributed seizures or seizures, focal seizures that secondarily generalize that actually also start in focal areas of the cortex but then spread quite rapidly to the surrounding cortex. And so you have this diffusion process through the network. And associated with this diffusion is recruitment of healthy tissue um, that's otherwise responsible for normal function, motor function, cognitive function, um, that gets recruited into the network and over time becomes incorporated actually into the seizure network and become secondary sites of dysfunction. And so the critical question that we wanted to ask is how, do, how does the network support this sort of distributed uh, passage of seizures um, in one case, but then is able to limit the spread of seizures in this other particular case in the focal network. By understanding this sort of mechanism of control, we can perhaps better identify interventional strategies that can leverage the organization of cortex to actually contain seizures just as 
just as is the case in focal net, in the focal seizures, but not necessarily in the distributed seizures. And so a key uh, critical question that we wanted to ask was, can we identify network mechanisms of focal, focal onset seizures that spread versus those that do not spread? And so in order to do this, we actually leveraged a, we actually leveraged um, online publicly available data uh, as a part of the International Epilepsy Electrophysiology Portal, it's IEEG.org. Uh, it was developed by my PhD mentor, Brian Litt, um, and it houses something on the order of thousands of data sets um, of epilepsy electrophysiology from humans as well as animals um, that are well annotated um, with the goal of crowdsourcing algorithms to better help epileptologists do their job to, of detecting seizures um, as well as intervening at certain at particular points. And so from this electrophysiology portal, we pulled a handful of patients that exhibited um, both second, uh, focal onset seizures and focal onset seizures with secondary spread. And we examined, we constructed functional, network, functional networks in each of these patients and then observed, observed uh, differences in their topology throughout. And so the first critical question that we ask is, how susceptible is the epileptic network to seizure spread? Can we quantify the susceptibility in some way? And so to begin, we can consider is that networks really, their job or their goal is to underlie some sort of communication between different regions of the brain. And on top of these communication pathways, what you have are dynamics that are, that are occurring based on the individual activity of, these, of each individual node in the, in the region that then can be propagated or diffused through the network based on the pattern of connections uh, between, between different nodes. And so if you envision two different types of topologies in this toy network, on top you see a network topology that has more homogeneous structure, um, that, that there's more order and, and more distributed connectivity throughout the nodes. Whereas on the bottom you have less, hetero, less homogeneous and more heterogeneous connectivity profile. And now imagine that in both cases, you had a seizure that started at the same node. And so we asked the, the question that is one network more amenable to seizure spread than the other network? And one way that you can envision this as some sort of traffic network or road network where you have uh, bottlenecks and pathways that are, that are in place that can kind of gate and, and, and facilitate the passage of information between point A and point B. And one way that, that graph, theoretic, graph theorists have, um, have quantified this sort of ability for diffusion to occur on networks is by measuring something known as the synchronizability of the network. The synchronizability of the network was coined by Barahona and Pakora in 2002. Um, basically, it states that the more homogenous a network is, the greater the synchronizability of the network, and the, more synchronize, the, high, the greater the synchronizability of the network, the, the more amenable it is to actually pass information through uh, from starting from one node and reaching all, all other nodes. Whereas in a network that has lower synchronizability, such as the bottom, uh, what you'll have is more localized passage of information uh, in the network. And mathematically, the synchronizability measure, uh, if, you're for, if you're familiar with graph theoretic notions, it's taking the graph Laplacian and then analyzing the eigenspectrum of that graph Laplacian. By taking the eigenratio of the largest and the second smallest uh, eigenvalues of that graph Laplacian, you can compute the synchronizability measure uh, for any given network. And so that's what we did for, for our constructed epileptic networks. And so recall that we constructed epileptic networks uh, or functional networks for two different frequency bands, a beta band and a high gamma band. And so what you, what you see here plotted is the synchronizability for these networks evolving over time. In purple, you have the seizures that exhibit focal onset but no spread, so seizures that do not secondarily generalize. And in red, you have the epileptic network that supports distributed seizures, or seizures that do sec secondarily generalize. And so what we find is relative to the seizure onset, the time of seizure onset, which is 0.0. .0. Everything before that is prior to the clinical onset and everything after is normalized to the duration of the seizure. So 
at time point 1.0 signifies the end of the seizure. What you find is that in this beta band, there is increased synchronizability of the distributed network that supports seizures that generalize greater than the synchronizability of the focal onset seizures, just in the middle of the seizure. Suggests that these distributed networks actually have a greater propensity to facilitate seizure spread in these beta band networks. Now recall earlier, I also, was, I also mentioned that these beta, these beta connections, these beta interactions actually uh, are reminiscent of long range functional connectivity. And so it's, it's probable that these beta interactions that we're seeing that have an increase of synchronizability uh, are actually facilitating the passage of these, of these seizure dynamics to much broader areas of cortex. Now, what's equally interesting is that in these beta bands, we don't, we don't see any significant difference in the, network, in the network synchronizability prior to the onset of seizures. This is truly capturing the propagation as it's occurring midway through the seizure. So now if we look at the high gamma frequencies, so these are measures of local connectivity in the network, um, what you actually find is that there's a diff distinction that predicts the evolution, the future evolution of a seizure before the seizure even begins. So if you look at this, this clinical onset at time 0.0, .0 the distributed seizures have a greater synchronizability relative to the focal onset seizures just prior to the onset of seizure. And then once the seizure begins, they equalize. And so what this, what this suggests is that these high gamma connections actually might be preparing the network for seizure spread by priming local connectivity in the area of potentially the seizure onset zone. But that's something that we haven't, we haven't been able to test as of yet because the synchronizability is a global measure of the network, right? It tells you overall, based on all the connections in the network, how synchronizable is the network. It doesn't tell us anything about who the key players are in the network. And so that's our second question, is that are some network regions more important controllers of spread than others? Is, there, is, is, is the spread through a network a heterogeneous uh, quality or trait of the network or a distributed trait of the network, or are, they, are there important key players that are better at facilitating spread than others? So in order to test this hypothesis, we developed a new computational tool called virtual cortical reception of the functional network. And basically in this tool, you can take, you can have in, a, in, a, in your baseline network, you can iteratively remove individual nodes from your model and test what the resulting change in the synchronizability of the network is as a result of that node removal. And so what, that, what, this, what this approach actually identifies is regions of the, of the network that are synchronizing or desynchronizing. And so for instance, in this toy network here that's shown on top, uh, you have your baseline network. And if you remove this green node here, what actually ends up happening is your synchronizability jumps up. Synchronizability increases. And so what this suggests is that its node role in the original network is to desynchronize the network. It actually, its role is to lower the, the synchronizability of the network. Similarly, if you take the purple node or the orange node, when you remove those nodes, you actually tend to decrease the synchronizability of the network, which in contrast to the green node actually is termed a synchronizing node because its role is to actually improve the synchronizability when it's integrated in the network. And so by iteratively removing every node in the network, we can, we can identify whether it has a desynchronizing or synchronizing role in the network. And if we think back to our traffic analogy, uh, you can envision that these desynchronizing regions that lower the synchronizability of the network are actually these red light areas. They're bottlenecks in the network that limit the synchronizability or the passage of information through the network. Similarly, these synchronizing areas actually are green light areas of the network. They improve the synchronizability of the network and permit the passage or flow of information. And so this is all well and good. This is just a contrived to, uh, cartoon of the, of of what's going on in terms of this virtual cortical resection technique, let's apply it to real data. And so on the bottom, what I'm showing here is an example of focal seizure. And on the left is uh, this virtual cortical resection technique applied to the functional network prior to the onset of the seizure. And on the right is during the onset of the seizure. 
On the y-axis here, we've plotted the control centrality. The control centrality is really just the magnitude change, or sorry, it's the uh, effective change in synchronizability once you've removed in a portion, uh, in particular node in the network. And so negative values here imply that they're synchronizing nodes, and positive values here imply that they're desynchronizing nodes. Now, what we found is that the epileptic network, compared to a null model where we rewire the network at random by randomly permuting the edges in the network, we find is that several of the network nodes actually exist in the bulk. They don't really have any significant, statistically significant effect on the synchronizability of the network. Whereas in contrast, we also identify desynchronizing nodes that compared to the null model actually significantly improve the synchronizability of the network when you remove them. And as well as synchronizing areas of the network that significantly lower the, the synchronizability of the network um, upon removal. And now these desynchronizing and synchronizing nodes, we not only found that certain nodes in the network uh, exist in both of these sorts of types of controllers, they're also, they're also exhibited in during, these, during the seizure themselves. So during the seizure as well, we were able to identify these synchronizing and desynchronizing regions. And so what we infer from this is that there is a heterogeneous profile of synchronization controllers in the epileptic network. It's not necessarily true that every single node has the same effect on governing or regulating the synchronizability of, uh, in the network. So what does this mean in terms of the ability for a network to facilitate seizure spread or not? So one thing that we found was that the seizure type can actually, distinct, can actually be distinguished by this virtual cortical resection technique. So on the left plot, you see a distribution of across all of our observed seizures during the pre-seizure state. And on the right, you see a distribution uh, during the seizure state. And now we're comparing focal onset seizures to the distributed seizures for each of the different control types. On the y-axis is the magnitude of the control centrality values, the magnitude change when you remove a particular area of the network. And so importantly, what we found is that focal networks actually, during the pre-seizure state, exhibit both stronger desynchronizing regions of the network as well as stronger synchronizing regions of the network. So both the desynchronizing and synchronizing areas of the network are much stronger in focal onset seizures than they are in distributed onset seizures. And importantly, we also verify that in the bulk, there is no real achievable difference. Basically, the bulk, everything is the same. Just a quick question. So during a seizure, you have increased uh, synchronicity and desynchronicity. So is there a temporal sequence to that? So does it become more synchronous, deep, more does it, does, it, does, what, does it become more desynchronous first and then become more synchronous? Do you, synchronous? Do you see anything like that? Yeah, so um, it definitely depends on the different phase of the seizure. Here we've, we've coarse grained across the time points in the uh, during the seizure, but yes, during the beginning of the seizure, you, you certainly see more uh, of a desynchronous effect. And then once, as the seizure progresses towards the end, when you, especially when you have your clonic firing during the end of the seizure, you see a more synchronous effect. But overall, during the, during the pre-seizure state, um, you see a little bit of both the desynchronous and the synchronous. Now, if we look at even during the seizure, what you do find is because we've coarse grained this across all time points during a seizure, um, you do see both the desynchronous and synchronous effect um, of these individual regions. But what's interesting is that your effect size changes drastically compared to your pre-seizure period. So during your seizure period now, your focal onset seizures have become extremely desynchronizing relative to your distributed onset seizures, or relative to your distributed seizures that, that do spread. This effect size is, is, is changes greatly and improves in the desynchronizing, for the desynchronizing nodes. For the synchronizing nodes, there's still stronger synchronizing controllers in the focal onset seizures than in the distributed onset seizures. Um, but but there's, no there's no achievable change in the, in the actual effect size. And so what this leads us to conclude for seizure type is that these desynchronizing and synchronizing controllers are actually stronger in the focal network. Uh, and their strength, at least for the desynchronizing areas, actually increases from pre-seizure to, to seizure. And this allows us to, to come up with a theoretical framework for why this might be so. We come up with a sort of push-pull hypothesis of the synchronizing and desynchronizing controllers in the network, where the desynchronizing and synchronizing controllers are actually at odds with one another. 
in one, for the desynchronizing controllers, you're trying to pull the network in one area of the synchronizability regime. And in the other case, for the, for the desynchronizing uh, controllers, you're trying to put, pull the network in the other side of the synchronizability regime. And so you have this putative push-pull mechanism of both of these push, uh, both of these sync and desync areas that are actually seeking to achieve some sort of homeostasis of network synchronization. Now, what's important is that we observed for the focal onset seizures that overall, prior to the onset of seizures, their synchronizability is at a baseline lower than the synchronizability of the, um, of the distributed seizures. And so what this suggests is perhaps that this increased desynchronizing effect relative to the synchronizing effect may be responsible for actually pulling the network a little bit more towards the lower end of the synchronizability spectrum than for the distributed onset seizures. <coughs> so these individual control profiles are different between the focal and the distributed onset seizures. And the question is, where are these where are these controllers located in terms of what's clinically known about the epileptic network? And so we can observe, finally, the regional distribution of these controllers in the network. So on top, we have, again, the pre-seizure um, pre epoch. And on the bottom, we've plotted the seizure epoch. And on the left, we look at the distribution of desync, bulk, and sync controllers only within the nodes that are in the clinically defined seizure onset zone. And on the right, we look at the, the distribution of these control types within the surrounding areas, so areas that are not in the seizure onset zone. And so what's interesting is that both during the pre-seizure and seizure states, there's no difference in the seizure onset zone in terms of these desync and sync, in terms of the distribution of these desync and sync controllers. Really the widest distribution that, that we see is in the surrounding areas. And so what this leads us to conclude is that this push-pull effect is actually occurring in the surrounding area of the cortex and not in the seizure onset zone. Really, a similar, similar concept exists in, um, in basic neuroscience where you have this idea of surround inhibition in the epileptic network, where you have the onset of the seizure and its eventual propagation or, um, is potentially inhibited by activity in the surround. And so what we... What we what our data suggests is that these desynchronizing and synchronizing controllers may be um, network mechanisms for this sort of surround inhibition. And so it leads us to hypothesize a potential architecture of the, of the epileptic network where you have this seizure generating area that's, that exists in both types, focal onset as well as distributed seizures. Um, but importantly, you also have this external area of the network that's also involved, that's sort of a regulatory network um, that in one case may be more compromised in the, in the case of distributed onset seizures, maybe more compromised than in the focal seizures. So in summary, what we're able to find actually is that the mechanism of seizure spread are, are if you look in the gamma band, are actually invoked before clinical onset. So they're, they provide some sort of predictive measure for whether a seizure will be severely impacting in terms of its, its secondary generalization before the seizures begin. Um, and that if we want to identify these fine-grained controllers of, of the synchronization of the spread, we can use this virtual cortical resection technique uh, to identify control areas. These control areas actually exhibit a push-pull mechanism that may be implicated in containing seizure spread to areas outside the seizure onset. Now, for future work, and this is stuff, these are, these are projects that we are actively uh, embarking on at the moment, um, We'd like to actually validate with respect to post-resection imaging um, this virtual resection approach. So imagine you have a patient who comes back after their epilepsy surgery several months after. Uh, we can quantify the area of cortex that was actually removed by resective surgery and validate based on their outcome whether our virtual resection approach, where you take the model and you start removing nodes in the network, whether the resulting change in synchronizability actually correlates with good outcome versus poor outcome. If that's the case, really our second goal is to then pursue some sort of prospective optimization of synchronizability for seizure containment. Perhaps in the, in the, in the context of resective surgery, you could iteratively identify, you could identify a strategy for res resecting a certain set of nodes that would change your synchronizability in some way, 
that would effectively lower your synchronizability in the areas outside of the seizure onset zone. Um, especially in patients for whom you can't remove the seizure onset zone itself when it's localized over areas of eloquent cortex, for instance. And so in conclusion, I'd like to acknowledge uh, several faculty and collaborators who have helped with this project, um, as well as the ongoing prospective studies. Uh, Dr. Danny Bassett, who's my postdoctoral advisor, Brian Litt, who's my PhD advisor, Catherine Davis and Tim Lucas, who are respectively a neurologist and neurosurgeon um, at, at the University of Pennsylvania, who helped collect a lot of this data and do a lot of the clinical annotation and clinical legwork to, to make this happen as well as all of our funding sources. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ankit. This was very interesting. 